it's a really a privilege to be here. And thanks for that great introduction, and thanks all of you for coming. Um, I'm really excited to hear. I didn't know when I came here about all this exciting activity in data science, and, and I didn't know about Dexter. So this is just fantastic news to see that Singapore is so excited about possibilities of data. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about actually a little slight different tweak on the original title, which was called the value of visualization. I'm going to call instead data tools for data enthusiasts. It's a similar similar theme, but I, I thought you might enjoy this uh, a little bit more. So uh, Dexter is actually an example of this idea of cultivating data scientists. And I picked, I could have picked your team, uh, what was it, Diva, uh, as an example of this. But many of you probably have seen like the Netflix Prize and the Netflix Prize team. And, uh, and then, of course, you may know about in, in the United States there were these quants. And the quants were the guys that sort of, sort of did data science for Wall Street. They were the people that sort of uh, originally figured out how to predict uh, stock prices. And um, the typical data scientist, as may be exemplified by this team here, is they tend to have, say, PhDs in applied math or statistics. Sometimes they have extraordinary computer hacking skills. Maybe they write Hadoop jobs or write programs that run on large data centers. Sometimes they do artificial intelligence or AI. But they're extremely specialized people. And a lot of the emphasis has been on building tools for them and training these kind of specialized people, and there's an important role for them. But I think there's even a broader class of users of data, uh, who I call data enthusiasts. And here's an example of some customers that we have at Tableau. Uh, one of our customers is eBay, and eBay, they have, uh, they have all these like uh, markets, like they have a market for dolls, and a market for coins, and maybe a market for old radios. And say you have this person that's running the market for dolls. Well, she's a doll collector. Right? She doesn't have a PhD in statistics or um, applied mathematics, but she knows a lot about DAOs. And at eBay, the management has decided that everybody that runs one of these markets has to be very aware of what's going on in their market. And if somebody asks them about their market, they have to look at the data and be able to tell them what happened. And so she might notice that the price of vintage Barbie dolls suddenly increased one day. And, and somebody might uh, flag that and say, why is that happening? And she has to figure it out. Like, is there fraud going on? Is maybe something happened in the world where the demand for Barbie dolls made as a collector that became active? And so this person who's, you know, you know, just a sort of a smart person that knows about dolls is looking at that and answering uh, questions like that. Another uh, company in the U.S. that's been very data-oriented is Zynga. Uh, some of you probably play, you know, Farmsville. But they were revolutionized. They revolutionized the games because they made all their game designers and game producers look at how people played the game. So what they would do is they literally every day see get data about what was happening in the game, and they would try to improve the game. And they literally would, would come up with a new version of the game once per day. And you know they would optimize it for gameplay, but they would also optimize it so they got a lot of revenue. In the case of Zynga they would buy virtual goods, and so they would you know, try to encourage people to buy uh, virtual goods. So you know, this, this is sort of, these are sort of non-standard uh, uh, users of data, if you like. You know, those are examples in business. I mean, I think business is where a lot of this is happening, but you know, in other areas of society, now doctors are looking at data. Uh, uh, we, we work with a Seattle Children's Hospital, and every surgeon there it's data about which patients are returned to the hospital. For example, if you do a surgery and one surgeon uh, causes trouble with their patients and they're always returning to the hospital, they will get data about that and the chief surgeon will actually know that as well. And so they're expected to you know, improve their performance or figure out what they're doing wrong. And then of course in the US there's a big problem with schools uh, where schools sometimes have high dropout rates. So there's a school district in the United States that actually has the lowest dropout uh, rate in the country, and teachers and principals now are looking at data every day, like attendance data and, and score data, uh, test score data, trying to keep these students in school, like seeing is there some early warning sign where that, that child might leave, leave the school. And I could go on and on with these examples, but these people that, that work with data are really not the traditional uh, data scientists. So I've been using the word data enthusiast for them. I use the word enthusiast because they're sort of a little bit early adopters. Not everybody does this, but I think they're going to be really common. There are people with questions, 
right? The, 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 the doctor is very interested in what happens to his patients, and he wants to know the answer to that question. Some statistician isn't going to ask, ask that question about his patient, and they're on a mission, right? That doctor is really interested in improving health care, okay? And they're very passionate about that. In fact, they're passionate about it because they think with data, they can become a better surgeon, right? They can find out what maybe they're doing wrong with the data that they wouldn't find out through other ways. So they really want to be a better surgeon, and they're going to look at the data to do that. You know, so they have a deep understanding of the business or their occupation. They tend to be excellent analytical thinkers, right? Teachers and doctors, for example, are good analytical thinkers. But they're not programmers and not statisticians. And I claim that for every one of these data scientists, there's going to be like 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 of these people. And uh, more generally, I, I grab this quote, which is one of my famous, famous, uh, favorite quotes about what's going on in the big data movement. But it's by Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google and has popularized a lot of the data. But this first paragraph is really worth reading because I think this is what's going to happen. The ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, to communicate, is going to be a hugely important skill in the next decade. Not only at the professional level, but all educational levels, from elementary school kids to college kids. And why is that? Because now we really do have essentially free and ubiquitous data. So the scarce factor is the ability to understand that data and extract value. See, to me, big data is really about ubiquitous data. All the really large data sets get all the attention. But when you have large data sets, you have small data sets. You have this long tail. And data, when it flows into an organization, it may accumulate somewhere and be big, but then it tends to flow out. At eBay, they collect all their transactions, but then the data flows out to the individual managers of the different stores. Um, and so, so we're going to get free and ubiquitous data. And then the question is, how do we train people to use that data. That's, and how, I guess at Tableau, we feel what tools should we build for these people that use the data. So that seems to be a really great challenge uh, that we have right now. So I just go, I just mentioned this, I, I grabbed this paragraph if you want to read it. But a lot of people, when they learn data analysis, they learn it from statisticians. But statisticians are just a part of the story here, uh, it's not the whole story. And in fact, what I've been doing at Stanford this year, I'm actually on leave, is I'm actually trying to put together a course on data analysis that we would teach uh, Stanford undergraduates, teach the Stanford undergraduates. And I just to tell you a couple of different things about it. First is actually, I think data analysis falls under this broader uh, thing called analytical thinking, which maybe seems sort of basic, but I actually think you have to have good analytical thinking skills to be a good data analysis person. And I actually think my job as a professor is actually to teach people to think, you know, with different ways of thinking. But anyways, here's my definition, maybe you just compare it to yours, but I think analytical thinking um, is a structured approach to answering questions and making decisions based on facts and data. It's maybe not too controversy, but let me just go through it for a second. A structured approach means it's not random search. You don't just get a data and just start randomly visualizing and flying through it. That's not going to lead anywhere. You've got to be you know, rigorous, and you have to develop methodologies for processing data and analytically thinking. You want to answer questions. You want to start with questions. That's really important because you know, it's like the scientific method where you have a hypothesis. So in our case, we'll call the hypothesis the question. You're curious about something. okay? and you want to find out an answer to a question. You want to, you want to get decision making involved in this because the analysis you do okay, depends on the decision you make. That doctor, if they're making a decision about somebody's life, about some treatment, that's a very serious decision. That Netflix prize team that's just recommending a movie, that's not a serious decision. You can use completely different techniques for recommending movies than you can for advising people about their medical care. And then, of course, based on facts and data, I think we all assume that's important. But you know, you have to put this in some perspective. I don't think the world is generally run based on facts and data these days, maybe in Singapore, but not in the United States. So uh, it's mostly hunches. It's you know, opinions. It's who has the power. 
It's not based on rational decision making using the data. So I think every one of these aspects of this is really important. And when you talk about uh, big data or data analysis or analytical thinking, you need to think about all these and, and more things. So if you're going to be a, a data analyst or an analyst, who do you emulate? I think you emulate Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Why? Because he, he's a detective. He's an investigator. If you're going to answer a question and figure out something, you've got to act like an investigator or a detective. You've got to track down that criminal. <laughs> You got to have the drive to do it. Okay, that's really important. You, people are good data analysts. They want to solve the problem. Okay, they're just not doing it because it's fun. They're interested in getting that criminal. And you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes has great quotes. I I read his books pretty regularly. But you know, he sort of epitomized to me what a you know some investigative analyst would do. You know, this quote: "It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data." Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts, right? You know, I mean, this maybe seems obvious to us, but again, it's back to facts and reasons. It's easy to have a theory about something, but is that reality? You know, let's get some information, get some facts. Uh, second, data, data, data. I can't make bricks without clay, right? You know, what a great, what a great quote. And, you know, think of Sherlock Holmes. He has this magnifying glass, and he's wandering around looking for clues, right? He's trying to find data. Just think how much work it is for him to find that data. He has to you know, work like crazy. Half the stories are about him finding the data. And you know, back to that quote, I started with that now we have a lot of data. I wonder what Sherlock Holmes would you know, think of nowadays if he was just surrounded by data all the time to put aside his magnifying glass. He might, you know, maybe he'd enjoy it. I don't know. But, he, but even if he did, if he had all the data, he'd go still look for some more. So part of that, you know, better than investigation is, you know, somebody just doesn't hand you a data set. I actually don't like people handing me data sets. When I teach visualization analysis, I make people go get the data. You gotta go get it. You might, you know, you might not go collect it, but you have to go find it and look at it. So anyways, so here's some of the things I think you need to do if you're interested in analytical thinking and data analysis. Uh, you have to learn how to pose questions. I, I, I keep coming back to this question thing, but I think it's the most important thing in some ways. Um, when I think of, what, again, back to, what, I'm a teacher too. What is, if you're a grad student of mine, what I tell you the first day is I'm gonna teach you how to ask the, the right question. Anybody can answer a question. The really smart people can ask the right question. Uh, but anyway, then you have these more practical things like getting the data, verifying it, normalizing it joining it with other data. All of these are quite complex steps. Then you get more into the simple analysis, look for patterns, relationships, summarize it, confirm hypotheses, and analyze error. That's the classic statistic. Communicate findings with others, which is not normally emphasized very much, and then make decisions and act. Uh, but and I could drill down to all these things, but I think you sort of get the idea. You really need to know a lot of different things in order to be a good analyst these days. So anyway, that, this is sort of, each week I sort of cover one of these, one of these topics. Uh, okay, so I just want uh, uh, to end, uh, I did say I was gonna talk a little bit about visualization. So just, just to preface this for a second, I think if you're gonna build tools for these kinds of people, they have to be highly interactive visual. And, you know, just they don't know how to program, they're not gonna type in scripts. So you want interactive tools. And I've been very interested in how people uh, use visualization and how to build visual interfaces. And I just want to tell you what I think is the single most important thing <laughs> about it, which has uh, uh, been researched most famously by a guy named Herb Simon and uh, his student Larkin. But it starts with this, uh, you know, a picture is worth 10,000 words, which we all have heard, I'm sure. But he has a paper, and this is the actual title of this paper, I recommend you read it. Why is a picture worth 10,000 words? And then he puts sometimes in there, which is sort of a hint. A picture might not always be worth uh, 10,000 words. So this is actually the crux of the matter, because if you know how pictures work, if you know how people use pictures to think, then you can design good visualizations. 
And in fact, you can design good interactive visualizations because they just augment this process of using pictures to think. So this is, this is pretty important paper. And I should mention, this paper is actually, just to encourage you to read it, this paper has been, is very accessible, easy to read, and it's been voted one of the 10, one of the ten greatest papers in cognitive science of all time. It's the only one involving visualization, I think. Uh, so it's really quite a landmark thing. But anyway, I want to show you sort of an example which is motivated by this paper, which is very simple, but I hope it gives you sort of a sense of what he found out in this research. So, you've all seen a table like this, and the first thing you'd expect the visualization person to say is this is a bad visualization. I'm going to tell you this is a good visualization. <laughs> so, if you ask this question, how much mint tea was sold in the West? Okay? So, you can figure that out pretty quickly, right? You, the columns are different uh, regions. Uh, so you see they're in alphabetical order, so it's fairly easy to find West because it's at the end of the alphabet. So you can scan through that very rapidly. Similarly, uh, for mint tea, you can see there's two tea categories, and then mint is one of them, and then you intersect those two lines, and, um, and you find what, $4,328. Now, you say, well, that, that wasn't so great, but the neat thing about it was you didn't have to look at all the numbers. Just, you use the headers to quickly find the data. Um, now, so, and, and, and what, what Simon did is he said you actually have an algorithm in your brain for figuring this out. You have a search algorithm. You, you scan the headers and you scan the columns. And in fact, this is actually recursive. It's a hierarchy, so it's like log n time to home in on this. So he said this is, takes like log n time to look up that number, uh, Simon would say. And he, you know, he would say this is a you know, pretty efficient, he called this an efficient representation of the data, given that you wanted to do this task of answering that question. So that's actually a pretty good way. And if you want to look up a number, there's nothing better than a table. But if you just take the same table and just tweak the question a little bit, <laughs> what product in what region sold the most? Okay? Does anybody know how to answer that question? Right, what are you doing? You're basically scanning the whole table. You have to look through the whole table, and it's just, this table doesn't even have it. No way you would shut it up yet, right? You found it? Nobody's found it yet. So it turns out that you can scan it and make a mistake. <laughs> but it, I think it's Colombian right. coffee. <laughs> Colombian <laughs> coffee, at least. Um, so the, the reason that this is not so easy is, I said, you had you scan it, but as you scan, you're also doing two other things. You have to remember what the max is, which you know occupies your brain. And second, you might end up, um, you have to subtract, you have to compare the next number with the current one, and so you're constantly doing this arithmetic in your head. And in fact, you're likely to either forget the previous max or, or do the arithmetic wrong. And in fact, that means you start over or get the wrong answer. So it's actually worse than scanning all the things. So this is a really bad, representation for this particular task. Now, if we just flip it around, same data, and just make it a bar chart, we can do this in constant time, because this is pre-attentive. This finding the largest value is instantaneous. So with Simon, so this, so this Simon, you know, he, he was a really great guy. He won the, um, he won a Nobel Prize for economics for his work on decision making, and he won the, eighth, the Turing Award in computer science for realizing that you apply artificial intelligence techniques to it. And this was sort of typical of the way he would think. He would thought the mind was sort of a special mental computer, but you could analyze what it did. And when you understood what it did, you could design things that worked well with the mind. That was sort of his, that's, that'll get you a, a Nobel Prize. That idea <laughs> will get you a Nobel Prize in, in the Turing Award. And so he got fascinated with visualization because he wanted to know how our mind process uh, these visualizations. Uh, so this, this is, it may seem like a trivial example, but this is the heart of the matter. Uh, and so this is the value of visualization. I, I just, I, I just want to mention this, and I use the value of visualization here to make, to say this in the strongest possible way. Because almost whenever I give a talk or go somewhere, somebody thinks visualization is just pretty picture. 
I don't know if anybody's ever heard something like that or thinks that. If you think that or heard it, you should, you should question it because there is undeniable evidence that with the right picture, human performance can uh, be improved dramatically, like a factor of 100 to 1. In fact, that example I showed you, it, if I could just time you, I could say, look up that maximum value and ask it how long it took. And you could show that in the bar chart, it took you, it was instantaneous. The other one, literally, I could give you a table and it could take you minutes. And that's a factor of 100. In fact, I can almost make it arbitrarily large, you know. If I make the right representation, I can improve your performance enormously. This is not, a, this is not disputed by psychologists. This is a fact, you know. And so you can measure this, and there are like thousands of papers. You can show you can do it faster, you can make fewer errors, and you can comprehend it better. Now, there's one, there's one gotcha here, is it doesn't say that, um, well, or there's one other subtlety. It, it turns out that almost any visual representation is better than no visual representation. Like imagine, like, I don't know if you, let's say you play chess. I used to play chess a, a lot. And I used to play blindfold chess. Blindfold chess is a lot harder than regular chess. So, but the reason that chess you have pieces is because you can you can um, look at the pieces and remember where they are. You don't have to remember them. You can I should, I should say you can see where they are. You don't have to remember them. So, a visualization of almost any form is better than no visualization because you can't keep all the information in your head. But if you have two visualizations, like the bar chart versus the table, then one might be better than the other. And I'll claim they're both visualizations because I, my definition is if you can see it, it's a visualization. You know, a lot of people don't think that, but that's my definition. So you can make a good visualization, but you could also choose a bad visualization. And that's what people, that's where people go wrong, is they make random visualizations that aren't very good. And when they make a bad visualization, then it works really badly. So you make a graph and you make a giant hairball with 10,000 nodes on a graph, you get a giant hairball, that's a bad visualization. That will slow people down and not be effective. So you've got to be able to choose uh, the, right, the right visualization. And uh, that's, that's where the craft of the field comes in. And in our software, we spend an enormous amount of time trying to sort of encode best practices in there so that if we know what you're doing, then we can often choose a better visualization for you. So I hope this argument is clear to everybody. If you remember this one point from my talk, I think, I think you've got it. So, um, so in Tableau, you know, we, instead of just trying to design one visualization, we actually created like a language for making visualizations. That was the idea, is you had a language. You can make sort of an infinite variety of visualization, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to, run, uh, to give you a demo, but you just make these visualizations by just using a drag and, drag, inter, drag and drop interface where you compose a picture that you want to see, and then we fill in defaults to try to make it as easy as possible to interpret. And we do tables, because tables are common, and time series and maps, because we think those are the ones that are most familiar to people. But the key thing is we can generate all sorts of variety, like this sort of set of you know, scatter plots next to each other for this side-by-side -side map. Because for different tasks, like if you're comparing things, these are much better visualizations. So a lot of, you know, so it's anyway, it's, a, it's just a language for, for doing this. And this was very much motivated by Simon's work on what that, about choosing the right representation for the task. Uh, and somewhat distinctive. A lot of visualization vendors and, and people try to, to try to create these single magic magical visualizations. They have one sort of special special thing that people solve everything. So let me skip the demonstration. So I'll just I'll just end by just saying that you know I think really need to spend more time thinking about all the people that use data, not just the most advanced. Uh, and you know that's really the people I'm interested in. I mean, I guess when I've seen computer technology over the years, it always starts out being for the advanced, and then it sort of becomes accessible to everybody. And that's the really fun time when it becomes accessible to everybody. Think of word processing, or, or even you know graphics, computer or digital photography. You know, it used to be something that was really expensive and nobody could do. Now we can all do it. 
But then you have to design your software differently. You have to know who the users are, what their skills are. And I'll claim they're not programmers and not statisticians. So you got to think about that when you write the software. Um, you know, I think everybody will be working with data. And I mean everybody. I mean, I think of like every Excel user. I think, actually, I think Tableau will be bigger than Excel, <laughs> to be honest. Because I don't think everybody does spreadsheets. I think you have to be sort of a financial guy to do spreadsheets. And we sometimes use them for other tasks. But I think in the future, we'll have more people using data. Just like, you know, you want to start with something. If, if you want to start with, a, like, we used to have drawing programs in graphics, and now we have digital photography. Photography sort of is bigger than drawing programs because you can start with a picture. Think of Tableau as an Excel that starts with some data and then lets you go on from there. But we need to teach people how to analyze data in this new world. And I really, what motivates me is to get more people so that they make decisions using facts and data, which I think is the ultimate <coughs> goal. So thank you very much. Clearly, whenever you reference Pixar, the burning question anybody has is, what was your favorite character? <laughs> in, in Pixar, oh, oh uh, Buzz Lightyear. That's <laughs> good choice. Um, <laughs> any other particular other ones? Or? Well, you know, I, well, we were really into the characters, so you know, it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of like kids, you know, you can't really quite have a favorite one, you know, you gotta sort of like a lot, yeah. Good stuff. Now, it's, <laughs> so it's um, moving on to sort of visualization, tablet. I mean, has anybody got any questions that they would they would like to ask? I mean, it, an obvious, while you just think and talk about it, oh, Mike, well done. Go on. Yeah, I saw on your slide when you're talking about the different stages of analysis, um, there was a piece about, um, you know, exploring the data set. Mm -hmm. um, and... You, but you also talked about a structured approach, and you know, ex exploration naturally got some sort of random exploration in it. And I was just wondering about how you reconcile the two and how you well, think about that. I, 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 you know, I'm a little bit, I think exploration is interesting, but I don't think it's random, it's just a little less structured. Like, for example, you know, when people went to discover, like, the U.S., they had a reason for, you know, getting in these ships and coming over here when they went and discovered the West Coast, Lewis and Clark. And they did explore. I mean, explorers don't randomly, you know. In fact, explore. If you're going to explore, you have to be particularly careful. <laughs> Can get killed, you know. I mean, and, you know, as a researcher, we're always exploring too. And I mostly have to keep my students from the trouble, you know, because they can just go and waste two or three years and not get anywhere. So, so I mean, I think you have to. I think people really err. They don't think through exploration the way they should. I mean, you want to go somewhere that's unknown. You want to try things that have never been tried. But even exploration, I think, is a little more structured than people people think. But there's something magical. You still want to sort of discover something you were, that's unexpected. And you want to put yourself in a situation to find it. But I think I think there are skills you can develop for efficiently exploring things. You know? And I, so I think that's sort of a, you know, an area that's of interest. There's not been a lot of research on that, but I think there's ways of building tools that encourage sort of good exploration. Great, David. Just, just want to take the examples that you use, the table and the bar charts, and based on your, ex your experience in the software, is there a particular way visualization, when it's presented, tends to you know, get more attention quicker? For example, you, you had the bar chart and you had the big green bar on the left. Would it be more effective if it was in the middle? Would it be more effective if it, if it was red? Or, you know, something like, is there, a, is there some science behind how you use oh, that absolutely. to capture? Oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, first of all, putting it in the middle helps a little bit, although not as much. But making, I mean, the mere fact that we use size, size is known to be a pre, what's called a pre-attentive variable. So you instantly can find the large. So if I were to show you 10,000 bars, you still would have found the first one. So it's where you, that's an example where you can do parallel processing. Color is another example of that. If you had one red bar and the rest were green, you would instantly find it. So yeah, all those are variable. Uh, where things get really complicated is when you start having more than one variable in play. Then they, then the different, then you can start fighting with your attention and then you can get in trouble. But that, that we can go offline on that. But, but generally there's a bunch of known sort of visual, we call them visual encodings or visual representations that are known to be pre-attentive. So you want to you want to use those. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And then in terms of, I mean, that, that's called pre-attentive. I think you're probably also thinking of more subtle attention. <laughs> like I would call that more emphasis like, or, or, or things of that type. So, you know, if you want to emphasize the comparison between two things, you should put them right next to each other. You know, I mean, that, that's an emphasis. And you still have to go to some effort to compare them, but that will emphasize the thing you want the person to do. So I think an emphasis, I mean, the pre-attentive, that sort of like just jumps at you, that's automatic. I think the more subtle attention is, is, is more, you know, more complicated and has to be designed in. Yeah. Any other questions from the floor? Um, I've just got one question. So if anybody has got a question, just put your hand up. Um, we've got quite a few people here that have started their own businesses. <clears throat> I mean, how hard was it to get Tableau going? It's really hard. It's, it's really, 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 really hard. But I mean, you're really, a really, you're a genius. You're a genius. So no, no, surely it would have been no, easier. No, it's right? really, 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 really hard. But no, I didn't finish. But it was, it's really, 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 really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I, 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 I totally understand Japan. <laughs> I mean, so what was, what was, what was the kind of breakthrough moment? Because obviously, you're trying to explain to people a new category, a new type of. Yeah, that that was always hard. So just to put it in some perspective, I mean, I. So my background, I was uh, trained as a physicist, and I learned sort of data analysis when I was in school. And my first job was actually doing plots, and you know, this was before we had computer graphics. So I always, you know, I think that when you're in science, you learn quantitative thinking and data analysis. So I was always really interested in that, um, and when I, I sort of decided to, uh, you know, go back to the university when I left Pixar, I wanted to do something involving graphics that was not entertaining. So that I was very motivated, uh, motivated uh, to do that. When we started the company, you know, ten years ago, I actually wrote a paper that you could have called the Big Data Manifesto at the time. I, mean, I, I think I used massive data instead of big data ten years ago, and literally the people we showed it to just laughed. They said, you know, if you plot from the beginning of time, the amount of data is going up exponentially. It's getting more complicated. This is obvious to everybody. You can't make a business out of this. You know, life, and then suddenly, I don't know, a couple years ago, I don't quite, well, I have some theories about what changed, but that fact that, I think, I think, well, I think I know what changed. Several very prominent companies realized that they could extract enormous value from data in ways that hadn't been done before, and that really changed our company. So when those companies, the Zynga's, the Ebay's, the Amazon's, the Google's, the Facebook's, the Apple's, you know, I don't want to leave out ones, but these certain companies, they were defined by their ability to process data, and that became widely known. And I think that was something that didn't, wasn't there when we started. It won't answer, but that transitional moment several years ago really sort of you know propelled us from obscurity into. You know. So it's kind of interesting observation. So I'm just going to leave Apple out because obviously it's been around for 30 years plus. But the companies that you named weren't really in existence more than 15 years ago. Right. So it was pioneers of the internet space, the digital space that really kind of started to drive the yeah. opportunity. Yeah, but I, but I would say retail. I mean, don't underestimate the retail. I mean, they may have been around for a long time. I mean, there are probably people in retail here. But you know, it's just unbelievable the analytics. I mean, I mean, the, one of the most amazing things that I found in, in my time at Tableau as I visit the customers is just how advanced businesses. You know, compared to the sciences, I mean, they're way more advanced than science. And the businesses that sometimes you think are least analytical are actually the most analytical. So retail, I think, is an example of, of an area where people have been very analytical. So, are there any more? Is there any questions? Sure, I just have one question. If, if you look at the normal user today, they yeah, maybe don't understand which charge to use. Are you planning to go in the direction to actually analyze the data and predict which is the best charge? Well, okay, so that's a great question. Uh, we, I think a lot about that. So we have a feature in our software called Show Me, where we, we, uh, we if you just collect some uh, figures, you collect some fields, and you hit show me, it will it'll automatically choose a chart for you. So we, we, we uh, do that already. And, th and that was because most people, exactly as you say. We also do a lot of other. We choose colors automatically. And we choose all sorts of things automatically. And that's it, it's not so much that we don't think people know that. We just don't want them spending their time doing that. Because they should be ask, ask, answering these questions, right? So the more time you're fiddling with colors and 
other formatting things the less time you're doing the analysis. So it's not that they can't do it, but we don't want them to spend their time doing it. But having said that, there's, um, there's, there's three aspects of this problem. I mean, one is you don't know what they're trying to do. I said the best representation depends on what you're trying to do. You can't, that's one of the great challenges in HCI, is you don't know what people are trying to do. If you could know what they were doing, you could build much better faces, interfaces, but you can't discover what they're actually trying to do unless they tell you and they, they won't. Uh, the second thing on patterns, we use a certain amount of pattern. Uh, you know, we, we do some analysis of it, uh, but we don't do as much as we should. I think there's a lot of potential there. If you could do, if you knew more about the patterns and the data to even Better. Okay. A good question. Great. One more question from Flo. Dylan. You said asking the right questions is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Right at the start of your talk, and then everything else kind of follows. Where do you think we are in the trajectory of machines asking the right questions better than humans? That's that's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, I think you know a lot of a lot of the debate is actually about what's the role of people, you know, and. Uh, you know, I sometimes in this talk I've actually included the example of Watson, you know, which I think is an unbelievable accomplishment to have that computer play Jeopardy. Um, but no, that Jeopardy asked, <laughs> I guess it answered this thing, whatever. But it gave the answer and asked the question. So I don't think it asked the right question. But I, I think it's going to be very hard for computers to ask the right question. I mean, um, uh, and, you know, we could get into a long discussion about that. But I think there's just a lot of knowledge about what's in there's a lot of data that the computers actually don't have. There's a lot of things that are personally of interest to humans that computers might not have. And, you know, I think that's I think that's one reason you need people involved is they want to ask the most important questions. But maybe maybe someday, you know, computers will figure out everything and we can just sit around and be sit on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so so just one last question from me as a lead in as a lead in to our next segment uh -huh. is you identified retail as a really interesting area of focus. What about healthcare? Oh, what about that's a good one. Education. I mean, you know, the nice thing about this field is that almost any area, you know, every area of business, every area of science, almost anything we care about can be improved by using vacuum. Great. Right. Pat, it's been an honor. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank really. You.